At this point, I'd like to turn the floor over to Sari Schumann, who is going to talk a little bit about the program and guide us through the rest of the hour. Welcome, Sari. Thanks so much, Steve. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today for the webinar addressing dementia in Indian country, where we are and what comes next. As Steve mentioned, the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center webinar series is supported by the Administration for Community Living. Before we start the presentation, Aaron Long of the Administration for Community Living will provide a brief welcome. Aaron? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule today to join us to talk about this most important subject. We are pleased to have Mike Splain from Splain Consulting and Carla Eden from the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe in Nevada to talk to us, and um, we're excited to learn from them. So back to you, Sarah. Thanks again. Thanks. As you heard, today's presenters are Mike Splain and Carla Eben. Mike is the owner and principal in Splain Consulting, a small advocacy and government affairs consulting firm based in Washington, D.C., and Carla Eben is the Numaga Senior Services Director director at the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe. She's a proud mother and grandmother, and she hopes to increase awareness of dementia on her reservation and to the tribes across the Western Great Basin. I will turn it over to both Mike Splain and Carla Eben for their presentation, and we'll do questions and answers at the end of the session. Mike? Well, good morning or afternoon, depending on your time zone. Welcome to our webinar, and I'm most excited to hear your questions and answers, which, as Sari said, will be uh, dealt with through the text box at the end of our formal presentation. Uh, as a consultant, I'm generally expected to uh, disclose who my clients are so that you can see uh, who they are in living black and white. Uh, and I assure you that none of my clients have any control over this presentation. Um, and I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Uh, I do want to thank the Alzheimer's Association for the dementia umbrella slide, which will be upcoming. Um, the path today for our conversation is as follows. Um, I want to do maybe five to seven minutes of level setting on Alzheimer disease and related disorders. Uh, we're fine, just, just in a way to level set our vocabulary, uh, to make sure we're all using the same words to mean the same things. Uh, I, we, we found this incredibly helpful as we've been venturing out with tribal communities and tribal serving organizations over the last couple of years. Um, after we do that level setting on Alzheimer's and related disorders, I want to highlight some of the solutions that are emerging that are both programmatic and from the public health sphere. And then I think it's really important to hear at least one live story. So I've invited Carla, um, who has become a friend, from Pyramid Lake to tell one community story about identifying and raising awareness and acting on dementia and caregiving. At the end of that, we'll pick up the questions and we will be done precisely at the top of the hour. So what is dementia? You know, we, even professionals in the field um, use the word Alzheimer's disease and dementia as if they're interchangeable. And I, and I think it's important to point out as a, as a way of starting, as a level set, that dementia is an umbrella term. It refers to changes in thinking, our cognitive functioning, and our behavior that interferes with our daily life. So dementia is a cluster of changes in thinking, uh, changing our behavior because the brain is the seat of our behavior, and it is severe enough that it is noticeable in our daily lives. Many things cause dementia. As you can see under this umbrella, Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, Lewy body, Parkinson's, frontal temporal dementia, and my personal favorite, other but you can see that there are a number of causes of dementia, but Alzheimer's far and away, including in Indian country in the United States, is the most common cause of irreversible dementia in older adults in our country. 
That said, many, maybe a majority of dementia cases have multiple causes. There are several scientific theories about uh, that I won't, I'm not a scientist or a doctor and I don't play one on television, so I'm not going to disturb you with my, my scientific ignorance except to say that there are schools of thought that suggest that vascular disease and inflammation must also be present for people with Alzheimer's characteristics, plaques and tangles, to actually experience the symptoms of dementia. So this, 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 this fact that there is so much mixed dementia, the fact that there are multiple causation theories about it, um, it it's, it's important from a, I guess from a scientific point of view, but from a practical point of view, the symptom of Alzheimer's disease and the related dementias that is most disturbing is the changing in thinking that changes how we behave in daily life and that interferes with our proceeding through our daily life. When people hear the words Alzheimer's disease, another level set here is that we sometimes only have a picture of Alzheimer's disease in our minds or in the public eye of our of Alzheimer's disease in the middle stages. And in fact, we may have a picture of Alzheimer's disease that it must only be an older person. We do know that about five to seven percent of Alzheimer's disease affects people under the age of 65. But that we have this picture sometimes of the middle stages of Alzheimer's disease or even the end of life, that a person with Alzheimer's must be old, they must be in, uh, unable to take care of themselves, they must be in need of care, and somebody else might have to be in charge of their lives in terms of making decisions for them. And why did that do that? Well, okay, let's go back to the slide here, guys. That's better. Sorry about that little clip. Well, interestingly, Alzheimer's disease over the last 10 to 12 years because of access to better diagnostics in general has been getting diagnosed earlier in the disease process. And it's now really discernible that we have not only persons with Alzheimer's disease when it is very disabling, but we have people in the earlier stages with less disability. If you follow the curve to, further to the left, uh, we have in very highly advanced scientific studies, let me repeat that, in highly advanced scientific studies, the capability of detecting the changes in the brain that are consistent with Alzheimer's disease through PET scanning before people actually show symptoms of thinking and changing in their thinking and changing in their behavior. Further to the left of this, we see that in fact there is a whole cascade of information that has come online in the last five to seven years talking about what we can do on a population and somewhat on an individual basis to reduce our risk of Alzheimer's disease in later life. So when I want you to think about, to level set, when I want you to think about Alzheimer's disease, we frequently have made policy, we frequently develop strategies about Alzheimer's disease and supporting family caregivers that are all over here on the right-hand side of the curve. But in fact, Alzheimer's disease is now understood to be a life course disease, and that's why one of the big changes in Alzheimer's, and I've been working with people with Alzheimer's and their families since 1986. I know I don't, I don't look old enough to have been doing that, but I started as a teenager. And I can't hear you laugh, so that's really not worth telling a joke, is it? Well, anyway, but I've been working with people with Alzheimer's disease for a long time, and I think one of the big changes is in the field is this comprehensive approach to Alzheimer's disease. And no more should we be thinking about Alzheimer's disease merely as the middle and later stages where the particular issues of respite, long-term care services and supports, uh, financing care, the interference with 
other health issues, other chronic diseases with people with problems with their thinking, that's a big part of and that's a big chunk of thinking about Alzheimer's disease. But then there's all this space to the left of the middle stage that we have under our comprehensive view. And that's why, as you see the red lines fly in there, that the tools, traditions, and the techniques of public health are becoming more online as a way of dealing with Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, if you look at this blue line, you'll see that the number of lives that we can affect through acting on Alzheimer's disease increases rapidly when we take a public health approach, we start to use public health tools and work on the left-hand side of this bell curve. This is the only original graphic I've ever created in my Alzheimer career, and uh, feel free to use it to explain the fact that Alzheimer's disease now needs a comprehensive approach, even as we deal individually with people that may be anywhere along this continuum, we somehow have to keep the comprehensive approach to Alzheimer's disease in our mind as we talk about solutions. So what are some of the emerging solutions? Well, one area of emerging solutions, specifically in America, with American Indian community, is in fact in the development of data. I think anybody who is um, familiar with health and health issues within and among the American Indian community would understand that because of the small nature of that community relative to the rest of the population, there is a disparity frequently in the development of data about Alzheimer's, about any issue, including about Alzheimer's disease. Uh, recently, though, we've started to see enough sampling through public health surveys known as the BRFIS, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. We've been able to get enough information from persons who identify themselves as American Indians in states with large American Indian population to begin to present data. This is an infographic here from the partnership between the Alzheimer's Association and the uh, Centers for Disease Control that is putting forth what we know about subjective cognitive decline. This is that space back to my curve, back to the left of that curve, where people's thinking is changing and they notice it. And you can see here that this is a very specific American Indian Alaska Native data set. So we're beginning to see on a national level and in a few states, we're beginning to see the emergence of data about American Indians and Alzheimer's and related dementias. The good news about this, as far as I can see, is that when a health organization or a care organization can actually count the number of people affected by a problem. This is a count of people affected by the problem in the very, very earliest of stages. Action can begin and whatever change we try to introduce to act on behalf of people affected by a health problem can also be measured. So data in my mind, the emergence of data, the emergence of uh, there and and what else? What other data will be coming online? I think we of course have a census. Hopefully you've all done it at least twice. It's like voting early and often. I grew up in Boston. What can I tell you? But no, I'm I'm, I'm very serious about the census. We are, but we will see 2020 census data, which I think we change some of our thinking about the nature and the extent and the sheer quantity of older adults in our American Indian communities, both and where they live, whether it's on or off reservation. I think the census is going to give us a whole new way of thinking about aging in Indian country. We have the continuing work by the CDC and the Alzheimer's Association using the MRFIS. There have also been a couple of National Institute on Aging studies that have been funded recently that are particularly looking at 
Medicare American Indians and dementia, which I think will start to come online and be available to community level planners. But as that all comes online, there is a mystery in the data. And it really comes back to what do we know about persons who identify themselves as American Indian or Alaska Natives who live in an urban area? What do we know about them and dementia? We do know from an AERP study by uh, IA Squared and Bill Benson and other fine people that 60 to 70 percent of people who identify as American Indian or Alaska Native live in an urban area. We know that they have chronic diseases at early aging. There seems to be some long-distance caregiving. We call it family uh, because I think the word caregiver is uh, more in the mainstream culture than in American Indian culture. But we don't really know an awful lot if people are experiencing dementia or early symptoms of some form of dementia. We really don't know a lot about what resources they access, what resources they use for diagnosis, care, and support. Um, and it's an area where um, there is a team at North Dakota, North Dakota University and others that are starting to really take a, an interest because so many people who identify as AI, AN, live in urban areas. But this is an area where, and I, I have no idea of knowing who's on the phone, but if you are a, from an urban Indian health center or an organization that mostly serves American Indians who live in urban areas, and you're deeply curious about this too, um, my contact information is on the slide because we'd love to talk. Well, that's one area of data. I'm going to stop being nerdy here and just talk about risk. We think there are some emerging solutions about reducing risk. Again, I'm on the left-hand side of the curve here, where people are pre-symptomatic all the way to the left, where what are possibilities through community health approaches that can graft onto what's already being done in Indian country that also have the effect of improving brain health. And for my money, as somebody in the field, and who's been deeply involved in putting forth strategies at the community level around risk reduction, I think hypertension and hypertension control is a big opportunity for reducing our community's risk of dementia in later life. We do know from the CDC, we do know that American Indians, Alaska Natives have hypertension in midlife and through their life in large numbers. As much as a third have hypertension. That may be, in fact, part due to different rates of smoking. And while 27% is the national average, there are regional differences in the data about hypertension and American Indians. Knowing that there is greater risk in the overall population of dementia if people have midlife hypertension from a several National Institute on Aging and international studies, public health authorities have begun to develop messaging material tailored to the American Indian culture and experience to put forth at the community level the notion that what's good for your heart's good for your brain, that a healthy heart, including controlling your hypertension, is something that can protect your brain for the long run. So this is, a, this is an example. This is a poster, and you see the reference to it on the slides. There are other materials. This is a poster that was created by the combined efforts of ASFO and IA squared. ASFO is the American, oh, the Society of, uh, no, I'm sorry, the Association of State and Territorial Health Organizations. 
IA Squared is a American Indian led and run organization, indigenous American Indian aging organization led by Dave Baldridge and others. And they combined their talent shortly after the public health roadmap for Indian country was published by the CDC to create a series of messaging, public health messaging materials that were culturally appropriate to get across this notion that what's good for your heart's good for your brain and begin the message about the links between hypertension and late life dementia. It's an example, there are others, but I thought this is this and this set of materials really strike. So there are opportunities to do something, again, from that public health perspective, to do something about now about risk. I'm waiting for the day, by the way, given that in the words of Dr. Neil Henderson, who runs something called Memory Keepers in northern Minnesota, he himself is a, a Choctaw from Oklahoma, why he's living in a cold climate, I still don't understand. But Dr. Henderson talks about how diabetes and dementia travel together. And I think to the extent that any tribe may be running a SDPI, a special diabetes program initiative, I would be really hopeful that people would be thinking about the links between diabetes and dementia risk and begin to infiltrate some brain health messaging into their work to help people struggling with diabetes or pre-diabetes. Just another example of where there is some light in terms of reducing risk. Well, another area where there are emerging sol solutions is in early detection. You know, if Alzheimer's disease or other dementia is not identified, and not in people's records, it's really hard to deal when they have other diseases. And I will also tell you, people want to know what's going on. People want to know what's going on. So in this area, we've seen the development by a co-op put together by the University of Wyoming, Go Cowboys. We've uh, seen the development of a number of culturally competent materials to explain abnormal memory changes, the early stages of Alzheimer's disease or other dementia, to illustrate them in really useful and culturally appropriate and culturally appropriate graphics and art that actually resonates with the people for whom it has been written and with whom it has been written, this is an area where any, any tribe could begin to, or any tribal serving organization, could begin to use some of the material, whether it's on prevention and risk reduction, such as what you just saw from ASCO and IA squared, or material specific to early detection and the warning signs of abnormal memory changes that could be a dementia available through this work by the University of Wyoming and others. Paid for with your tax dollars, so uh, please if, take advantage of it. And again, the link is in the slide. Um, one other um, hopeful sign about emerging solutions around Alzheimer's and other dementia issues is the development of the roadmap. I had the privilege of being a lead on this document from the Alzheimer's Association side, but I will tell you it was a major collaborative work that involved people like Aaron, uh, who's on the call, and others who have deep wisdom about Alzheimer's and related disorders, but also a number of people who are themselves uh, American Indian health and public health leaders contributed to this roadmap for Indian country. It's intended as a discussion starter, and as you will hear, a lively discussion starter uh, in the case of the Pyramid Lake Paiute, uh, but it's intended as a discussion starter and a way in which we can begin the conversation about Alzheimer's dementia and caregiving in Indian country. 
With that, I am going to reintroduce Carla. Uh, Carla is, my, my, is, is one of my elders that I am so pleased to have accumulated in the last two years and brought into my life and into my work. And she's going to talk about the experience in Pyramid Lake. Let me just offer the following observation, because Carla won't tell you this. Uh, she recently has been unable to work in her normal office because she was quarantined. And so uh, we don't have lots of pretty slides from Carla, but we have a spectacular story. She's a great storyteller. I'm going to be quiet and turn it over to Carla Eben. Thanks, Mike. Um, first of all, I want to say thanks for the invitation to come and share our story. Um, Good day. How are you? My name is Carla Eben. I am Northern Paiute. My band name are the Kiwi Eaters from Pyramid Lake, Nevada. My Paiute name is Sandy Soil Dry Earth Flower, or Desert Flower, given to me in ceremony. I am currently the Numaga Senior Services Director at the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe. I have been in this position since mid-2017. Today I want to share a story with you about my experience with dementia awareness and education. But first, let me take you back to what inspired me on brain health in the first place. In the fall of 2017, I received an email announcing two-part training on dementia and hoarding. I, bought, I told my boss I wanted to go. He approved my travel and I went. It was a two-hour drive on Interstate 80 to Winnemucca, Nevada. I was excited to be going to learn something new. In the first part of the training, we learned about dementia. We learned, about, we learned that it was an umbrella term used to describe a range of symptoms associated with cognitive impairment. We learned that there are different types of dementia, with Alzheimer's being the most common. We learned about the changes in memory, thinking, concentration, judgment, problem solving, and functioning, all of which affect a person's ability to perform normal daily tasks. The presenter gave us vivid, real-life examples of former patients. <clears throat> in the second session of the training, we learned about hoarding. She defined the disease, gave us the symptoms and statistics, and we learned about the three stages of hoarding. People who have clutter, people who have collections, and people who hoard. Again, she gave us real-life examples of former patients. It was really sad to hear. Over the, after the session was over, we did a survey, and she asked if we had any questions. I did, as I noticed I was the only native in the room. I asked her if she sent her announcement out to Indian country, meaning Nevada tribes. Her response was, yes, but they never come. As I drove home that evening, I kept hearing those words playing over and over in my head. Yes, but they never come. Before I reached home that night, I decided I was going to change that. Next day, I emailed the health center on a reservation to ask if IHS does any type of training on dementia. I asked if we had a doctor that specialized in serving our elder population. I asked if the clinic staff would come and do a training. To all my questions, the answer was no. Next step, I reached out to a friend of mine named Jessica at the Cooperative Extension Office at the University of Nevada in Reno. I excitedly told her about my trip to Winnemucca. I told her I needed someone to come and do a training here at Pyramid Lake on dementia and or hoarding. The training would be for the elders and caregivers. She told me she'd ask around and get back to me. About a week later, I received an email from her. She had found Dr. Jennifer Carson at the UNR. She asked when I would be available to meet with Dr. Carson. We scheduled a meeting and we met. Dr. Carson was very excited to work with the tribe. She said they had never worked with any tribes. Over a few more meetings, we picked a date and location of our first training. It was kind of funny, Jennifer kept calling us the Paiute tribe, but we had to educate her that there are several tribes in the state of Nevada, including northern and southern Paiute. It was a learning experience on both sides of the table. Jumping ahead, in early 2018, the tribe received a grant announcement from the State of Nevada Aging and Disabilities Division. They were accepting applications for the Dementia-Friendly Nevada grant. It would follow the Dementia-Friendly America model. 
I decided to apply. I completed the application and asked Jennifer to critique it and give me some feedback. She reviewed it and sent me some comments. I changed a few things and I submitted it. A couple months later, later, we received a letter saying we were awarded the grant. We became Dementia Friendly Pyramid Lake. The state already had selected four communities in 2017. Washoe County, Elko County, Humboldt County, and urban Southern Nevada. They looked to fund three more communities, but only selected two, the town of Pahrump and the Pyramid Lake tribe. I later learned that Pyramid Lake was the only tribe in the country that had ever applied for and received the Dementia Friendly America grant. Since this grant follows the Dementia Friendly America model, it's geared towards people living with dementia in urban settings. It's designed to educate neighborhoods on how to be more inclusive to people living with dementia. Examples in that urban setting could be hospitals, banks, restaurants, retail stores, entertainment, etc. We really had to be creative with our grant. Most reservations do not have urban setting services on every street corner, if we even have streets. Our grant listed tribal departments, tribal clinic, social services, mental health, emergency response, victim services, tribal court, tribal administration, housing, etc. Our Dementia Friendly Grant listed three main objectives. One, to educate our elders and caregivers. Two, to educate the tribal departments. And three, to educate our neighboring communities on dementia, communities that might not have the resources to bring trainings to their reservations. During the year, we had partnered with the UNR Sanford Center and were able to complete a community needs assessment survey on dementia. We also established an advisory group called Bishaf Tsunami, in Northern Paiute meaning Good Think. Our group met once a month. To meet our first and second goal of our dementia-friendly Pyramid Lake, we hosted four trainings. Dementia, an introduction from a social relational perspective, dementia friends, dementia champions, an educational session on dementia. To meet our final grant objective, Bijel Tsunami hosted the 2019 Nevada Tribal Summit on Brain Health and Dementia. We sent invitations to all tribal leaders across the state, to all of the dementia-friendly Nevada partners, and to all local tribal elders programs. Pyramid Lake hosted this one-day summit and invited four nationally known speakers on the topic of dementia. Each speaker had about an hour of the portion on the program. Mike explained did an overview and de an overview and development of the CDC Alzheimer's Association publication, a Roadmap to Indian Country. Dave Baldridge, who is of Cherokee descent, spoke on customizing and implementation of the roadmap. Dr. J. Neil Henderson um, spoke on dementia and diabetes among Native peoples. Dr. Peter Reed from, from the Sanford Center on Aging spoke to us on the Comprehensive Geriatric Assessment Clinic at the University of Nevada at Reno. We had 113 participants sign in with 14 tribes represented. Midday we broke for lunch and had a heart healthy, brain healthy meal prepared by one of our tribal elders. Lunch included grilled chicken with avocado and corn salsa, a side of tomato basil quinoa, a green salad with smoked trout, pine nuts and wild berry dressing, baked acorn squash with maple syrup and pecans, and for dessert we enjoyed berry cobbler all in road. I have to share something with you. Remember the presenter who told me, yes, but they never come? Well, she came to the 2019 Nevada Tribal Summit. I was a little embarrassed when I first met her, but then I told her, thank you for being my inspiration. Had it not been for your presentation in Winnemucca, all of this would have never happened. I can proudly say that our efforts have been acknowledged and are included in the CDC Alzheimer's Association Roadmap for Indian Country. Our summit had four articles written in the Dementia Friendly Nevada Final Report in the section Community is the Answer. And here are the four titles. One, Lighting a Fire of Advocacy in Indian Country. Two, Reducing Dementia Risks in Indian Country. Three, a landmark dementia event for Nevada tribes, and four, if Thelma and Louise were older and wiser. I was also asked to sit on the panel 
in 2019 at the National Title VI Training in Minneapolis, Minnesota in a session called Dementia Assistance for Indian Country. And I was going to speak at the ninth annual Taking a Stand Against Elder Abuse Conference in Fort Hall, Idaho, but it was canceled. I am content that we have accomplished all of the goals we set for ourselves, and along the way, we have established a good working relationship with the UNR and other non-tribal agencies in Northern Nevada. We also have support and guidance from the Older Americans Act staff and Indigenous Aging Group, Plain Consulting, and local and regional Alzheimer's Association. Our Dementia Friendly Grant ended September 2019, but the work did not stop there. Using the Roadmap for Indian Country, we hosted an evening event we called the Talking Circle on Dementia. We covered the eight questions from the roadmap. It was our intention to continue over the next few months to learn about dementia in two more talking circles in May or March and May 2020. Talking circles in March and May didn't happen due to the outbreak of COVID-19. Where do we go from here? We're applying for the grants through the Administration on Community Living to continue to educate our elders family caregivers, and tribal departments here at Pyramid Lake and across the Western Great Basin. Dementia is definitely on the rise in Indian Country, and we need to learn more about it so we can better serve our elder population. I'm excited to see where we go from here. Matnaskwa. Back to you. Thank you so much, Carla and Mike. Mike, do you have any other um, comments you want to make before we move to the questions? Um, just a just a quick point that uh, through a fair amount of advocacy and internal and external, uh, just proving that the point has been made about the need to address these issues in tribal communities. There are currently two tribal specific funding opportunities available through the federal government, one through the administration on aging that is still open until June 13th. Sorry, June 9th. I know I asked you that, Erin. Sorry. And then uh, through the Centers for Disease Control, uh, there is funding also being made available or opportunity available for funds under something called the BOLD Act, which is specifically to build public health infrastructure around issues of Alzheimer's and caregiving. I think this just shows that there is both uh, need and interest in this part of our nation um, and in the sovereign nations about these issues and that there's also an understanding that a little a little bit of financial support could make a very big difference in both in terms of what we can learn but also in terms of what we can do to support people living with Alzheimer's and other dementia and their families. Our questions? Great, thank you so much for your presentation uh, to both of you. And we'll move on to the questions that have come in so far. Um, and I want to make a note, please do take a moment to enter your questions into the Q&A um, section of the webinar platform. And we will get to as many of them as possible. Uh, so the first question that came in, um, and this can be, um, Carla, you can respond to this, and Mike, if you have anything to add, please do so. Um, the person is asking, can you please elaborate on the role and experience of traditional healers into culturally competent dementia care assessment and treatment among indigenous aging population or throughout Indian country? Here at Pyramid Lake, we, um, we're, we're taking baby steps. We're still trying to figure out where we're going. Um, so we haven't gotten that far yet. Mike? It's a, it's a brilliant question. And I think um, I've actually, you know, and I, I, I think what, where people are taking action on these issues, as I've observed it so far, they're trying to avoid, first of all, trying to avoid collisions between um, uh, medicine traditions. I think second of all, um, there there has been some thinking and a little bit of writing, most of it out of Canada, about how do we 
how do we find the threads of brain health in traditional practices, traditional practices around eating, traditional practices around uh, being physically active. So how can we connect the threads of the native communities uh, that are that directly connect to risk reduction? How can we connect those things together in a series of uh, either activities or messages? So I think that's what I see more than anything else. It's it's at a very beginning. I, I think also complicating this is the point I made about the urban dwelling persons who identify themselves as American Indian or Alaska Native. It's this is another area where I, don't, I frankly don't know. We know an awful lot about um, how tied or if they're tied to traditional medical pro, uh, or um, or traditional medicine um, or, or practices. So that's what I've seen. I'm glad to, I mean, I'm glad to follow up on it with you offline, uh, but there is a resource center in Canada that's, um, and th their website is not coming to my mind that has written an awful lot about that. Great, thank you so much. And we have a, kind of an overarching question. Um, is asking, you know, what is the best way that um, people working in aging and dementia care and others can help support local First Nations peoples when they um, would like to help tribal leaders but are not sure where to start? What's a, what's a good opening to get that conversation started? I'm going to let Carla do that. Good opening. Um, probably just being open to uh, open to asking what what customs are. I remember when we had our first meeting with Jennifer at the UNR, um, Dr. Carson, and one of her first questions she asked me was, "What do Native people think about what do Native people think about uh, dementia?" And I said, ooh, deer in the headlight. I don't know. I said that families always just take care of each other and it, it's just something you do. That was written in one of my one of the articles that, that I read um, the titles to you guys. Um, when my grandmother was when my grandmother I was I was going to college and my grandmother got sick and we I, I quit I quit going to school. I came home to take care of her. That's what Native families do. So I guess just being aware of, of uh, custom, you know, and being open to um, working with families, I think, if, you know, just working with families, asking questions, um, and not exclude tribal traditions when taking care of elders. When I started working on the roadmap, I engaged a gentleman who is Ojibwe to be of assistance, both on research and cultural questions. And the first time we met, he touched his eyes, he touched his ears, he touched his nose, and he touched his mouth. And then he turned to me and he said, what did you just learn? And I said, I should see, listen, and smell a lot more than I talk. In the kindest way possible, he was really teaching me to, to, that the fundamentals of going on this journey with the American Indian community would really rely first and foremost on my ability to be a listener and to not tell. And that's why I'm excited about a roadmap as something that can promote a constructive and a thoughtful conversation as one example. I, th I think also uh, we have to be conscious, particularly if we're, uh, if we're going to work from the mainstream community into a reservation, I think we have to be super conscious of both tradition and the fact of sovereignty. 
not just a, it's not just a, a tradition. It is a settled law, as people say. And you see that uh, in the headlines the, in the last few weeks about COVID, for example. So I think that's, uh, I think understanding that on a, on a serious level, and then really understanding how to, how to partner and to not necessarily come in with a set of preset conclusions or solutions that may or not may or may not be relevant to the community. I will tell you two decades ago, just one example, two decades ago I funded a project with the Diné, the, the Navajo Nation in the four corners of our country. And the first meeting of that project about supporting Alzheimer caregivers almost broke the entire project because as it turned out, at that time, the Navajo had no word that was the equivalent of caregiving. And so I think language, and I think and we, this, is, this story repeats itself over and over again. You heard Carla talk about some of their initial meetings. I think, I think we've got to watch our language and, and learn. Great, thank you. You know, we have a few questions that came in about um, a asking if there are any culturally appropriate dementia screening tools for uh, the American Indian, Alaskan Native uh, communities that either of you know of. Oh boy. <laughs> if it's if it's, it's no. No. That's so. Okay. So let me. So I think. I mean, this is a this is a loaded. Uh, this is a problem area for everybody. But let me just say mm -hmm. a couple of things. I believe that um, the the Banner Health Institute in Arizona has adapted with permission one of the main cognitive, uh, simple cognitive tests that is in use everywhere from research, everywhere. It's called the MOCA. They've made some cultural adaptations of the MOCA test, but as of now, they have never run a randomized controlled clinical trial to demonstrate that it is as effective at detecting cognitive impairment as it is in the white population. Um, I think further that the Mohawk in New York, sorry to keep being lower 48 focused here, my friends, but that's what we know. The Mohawk in New York have worked with their local Center for Excellence in Alzheimer Disease to do an adaptation of another cognitive test with the permission of the test developers, but that again has not been through uh, what many believe to be the um, acid test for such an intervention a randomized control clinical trial. Having, so those are two places where I know there's, there is actual screening with tools going on, and that's the state of the tools. Great, thank you. Um, we have one question um, asking about how, if there are ways that you know or can think of that an urban library system might be able to help the Native American community. Um, they, they were talking about doing outreach or programs, information, um, making materials available. What, what other ways might an urban library system be able to help in this effort? Carla, you got any thoughts? Um, library. Urban library. Well, it, I guess it depends on where you live. A lot of a lot of the urban areas do have, um, like here in Nevada, we have Nevada Urban Indians, who does a lot of outreach within the city to 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 anywhere that needs like um, resources. Um, I think that that would probably be the best to look up and see if there's something local. I mean, I know that a lot of a lot of tribal or not, a lot of bigger major cities have Indian centers that have some 
some resources or access to resources. So I would probably start there. So what comes to my mind is the possibility that a library could be a convener uh, and, and be a, a neutral place where people that are interested in this issue could have meeting space and, um, and, and enjoy hospitality to talk some of these issues through. I, I think further, uh, there is a digital divide. It's real. Uh, there is a there there is and as any of us that have kids in our house that are trying to quote unquote do online school that that may not have the gear no it, there's a real digital divide and to the extent that an urban library is and can make available uh, resources that are increasingly only becoming available in the digital world I think that would be that would be a terrific contribution. Um, and I think the, the, last, um, uh, the last is do what you can to preserve stories. I mean, sorry, when I was a kid, I got punished by my parents because by, they would take away my library card. So you know how much I love books and story. But I think, to, you know, it might be very interesting for a library to take a lead role in collecting story about dementia and caregiving and long distance as a way of both preserving memories and honoring elders and our and, and our traditions but at the same time uh, collecting information that might turn into some kind of an initiative so I think those are things that come to my mind when I hear library great thank you Interesting question um, came in for you, Carla, um, that you might have some insight on. Um, they were asking, since families are usually in, um, uh, in tribal nations, are usually taking care of their elders, is there a difference in caregiving abilities and willingness in tribal nations that may have greater resources than those that have fewer resources? Mm. We, I, a Pyramid Lake is not like a, it's not like a really big tribe, but it seems like we've been able to work with the tribal health system to reach out to the to the families that we have here on the reservation. Um, I know that in the future the UNR is going to be doing um, the assessments out here. Um, we're looking at um, trying to bring on more staff um, to to like as um, I don't know, like a like an advocate or a liaison between the the elder, the families, and the services available. Okay. Um. Let's see here. Um, would either of you be able to um, talk a little bit about if you're you know of any um, tribal lands that host memory cafes or have memory care units on the premises and how those might operate? If there are, I didn't find them yet. Okay. Got it. And I don't know, I don't know of any. Okay. So, um, let's see. Ken, um, can you, Mike, do you know if the materials from University of Wyoming, um, the culturally competent materials you mentioned, are available online at all or available yeah, the, for Yeah, well, the, web, the link is right there in the, on the slide. Ah, okay. Um, I don't have that slide in front of me, so I missed it. Um, what person was asking if you, you might have mentioned this, but they, they would love to hear a little bit more about how the two of you connected and, um, you know, how this, this partnership has kind of grown to be what it is today. Okay, this is Carla. When, when we first started talking about having um, a summit, I reached out to ACL and said, okay, I need, I need some advice, I need some guidance. Can you send me a list of people who know about 
dementia in Indian country. So they sent me a list. On the other end, Jennifer at the UNR, she went researching and she compiled a list. So when we got together at one of our meetings, um, our lists were almost identical. There were a couple of differences, but our lists were almost identical. And we thought, okay, we're all on the same page here. Well, let's invite them. Let's reach out to them. Let's invite them. And that's how we ended up bringing out um, Mike and Dave Baldridge and J. Neil Henderson. And um, Peter is actually, um, Peter Reed, Dr. Peter Reed, is actually Jennifer's um, husband. They just have different last names, but they, they, are, uh, they are a couple. Um, so that's how we ended up meeting. Great, thank you. Uh, and a question about um, the ability to use um, products that are designed for one native population. Um, is it, is it, are you able to use the same products and materials for other native tribal groups or would you have to do some um, modifications and edits just based on customs and culture? Oh boy. You know, it, this was one of the earliest challenges when we started the roadmap project. I mean, because there are approximately 575 federally recognized tribes each sovereign and each with their own language and, and cultural traditions and home. And it's impossible, and we, saw, we have a couple of questions in the box from Alaska, and we will follow up, we promise Alaska people. Um, you know, and so the question is, can you possibly develop something that is universal? And the answer is no, there's as, there's as much diversity between the 575 tribes as there is between American people who identify as American Indian or Alaska Native and Amer African Americans and whites and Hispanics. I mean, there's just that much diversity. So I think the, the, there, there needs to be a constant process of listening and adaptation and customizing uh, to, the ex to the extent that things are needed. But I wouldn't, in that customization, the one thing that I would be leery of is to uh, explain Alzheimer's and dementia issues away in purely um, cultural terms. We have been, from the very beginning of the Alzheimer movement in the United States and around the world, we've had this difficulty where people assume that dementia is normal aging. And I think we, we've seen that, we, we've, we've fought that intellectual battle over and over and over again. And I think it's, it's one that I would be leery of in trying to culturally adapt things, of merely allowing these, these health issues to be explained away as normal aging. That's, that's the only wisdom I have about it. But if anybody on, on the phone has been inspired, anybody on this call has been inspired to act, let me remind you there are the two federal uh, the two federal programs that have funding notices out right now and available. Um, there are other folks that are interested in this and we're all trying to build a community of interest and support uh, across the country and within the country on these issues. So we're, we'd welcome uh, anybody who wants to be part of the party to join in. Great, thank you. Well, that's all we have time for today. I want to thank you both for your wonderful presentations and I invite all of the participants to join us on June 16th for our next session on building the dementia workforce. And I will turn things over to Steve Moore for just some final remarks. Great, thanks everyone. Great presentation. I want to thank Mike and Carla for being here, as well as Sari and Aaron Long for being here with us as well. Time for us to wrap up, everyone. We've reached the end of our hour.